Sean. John. What's up, dude? How's it going? So good. Last episode was with your new business partner, which is like really exciting. So we talked about, uh, I guess, how it started in Lior's mind. So I'm really, really excited to talk to you about like in your mind, because yours is entirely different from Lior's. Like your thoughts on it. Um, So I guess my first question is, can you give a little bit of your background um, and probably a, a couple things that you think you might have taken from your previous job that you'll be able to like utilize effectively and like EM legal? Oh yeah, perfect. Yeah. Um, so my background is in patent law. That's where I went to law school for. I have a background in physics. That's where I did undergrad with. So when you're studying the sciences and you're doing patent law, um, you're very detailed oriented. You know, you don't really look at the, you know, 30,000 foot view of things. You get right down in the minutia. I remember one time we were reviewing, um, some various claims in a patent and we were debating about a comma for a few days because it just, it changed Say a few days, a few days because it changed, it, <laughs> it changes the dynamic. You're getting paid by the hours. What's going on. I get it. it it's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, we were yeah. actually were. And then even when we were home, we we're like texting each other like, well, what, could that mean this? Could that mean that? And stuff. so all in all, I mean, you're very detailed oriented. Sure. And, and after dealing with that, I was doing patent prosecution, which is basically patent preparation. So an inventor comes comes in, says they have the next greatest idea. You then help them get a patent. And it's a several year process that you do. It's a several year process to get a patent. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, even I'd say best case scenario, you're looking at about three years. Usually it's around maybe like four, maybe five. What's the cost associated typically? Or is that? Uh, so generally, if it's a, if it's a, Straightforward mechanical patent, like, hey, you know, I have this new, you know, watch part that I'm that I thought of. Um, I'd say about about seventy five hundred to about ten k for the application, okay. and then if you're dealing in with some of the more profitable biotech type of stuff, um, you could easily get into twenty thirty k uh, for the, just for the patent and stuff because okay. you have potentially hundreds of millions of dollars at stake, you know, with 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 that. Um, technology that they've developed for sure there. so sometimes people will have an idea for a product but there'll be like multiple patents in it is that a because i know and i'm super ignorant when it comes to this kind of stuff so if there's a product and it has 10 new pieces of technology that need to be patented but they all work together synergistically is that a, like also patentable yes and what you'll frequently see is that they will reference those applications within the same patent so um, if you do, if you look at a lot of um, industries type of stuff like Pratt and Whitney, um, a lot of times when they're, for example, like if they come up with a new turbine blade, it's part of a new engine that they're developing. So a lot of times when you're looking at just like one rotor blade that's shaped slightly differently, that does something with the air as it's either entering or exit or exiting, um, you'll see in that same patent document maybe four five, maybe even up to 10 other applications because it's being developed synergistically, like where it's part of a uh, broader scope and broader idea that they put together. And you see that across across the board with many different things. Uh, biotech as well. Um, a lot of times, you know, things aren't discovered in isolation. It's part of a, a broader thing that they've kind of discovered. So they want to get it in as quickly as possible in terms of like beating out the possible competition. Because I mean, you have to understand that Companies are really nervous whenever they come up with something like this, of somebody possibly taking it, leaving you know, leaving Google, starting working with Apple, and yep. then bringing that stuff in their head. I mean, we do have like non competes, and you know, but there is an issue of a litigation that could come up with that. So generally, if they come up with an idea, they want it patented as soon as possible. And that's amendable too, right? So if they yes. have to move the patent around during the application process, like yes, fifty percent. That's fine to do. Yes, yes, you, and you usually see that. Um, relatively often. A lot of times uh, what people will get is what's called a provisional application, which is a one-year placeholder. They will go ahead and say, I've got this really great idea. Um, I've developed it, but I haven't worked out the minutia of it. They'll have maybe like a two, 10 page white paper of what they've done. You basically file that white paper, file um, some proposed claims, which defined, you know, the kind of like, it's almost like a property line, really. You're basically defining what is your thing in the Mm -hmm. claim. It defines the outer boundary that everything within this boundary is my idea. Everything else is everything else. So you'll then do that, have some brief description and stuff, and you'll submit that. That's not your final application, but it is your placeholder. 
um, so that you know you can at least say, look, I got this, da- you know, I got this idea here, and I filed it here, so that if somebody uh, comes up later on and says, well, no, I have this idea, it's like, no, look at the date on the application, and then what you do is you have like one year from that date to kind of like massage the details of the idea, and then some change some things, maybe do some more research and development, um, maybe figure out some best. Uh, um, you know, ideal uh, uh, um, parameters that that product can then work in and then kind of go on from there. So a sneaky move that I've heard that a lot of companies do will keep things in the application process. Is that valid? Like, can you apply or like if like delay that all you, the way or no? You, you can and you can strategically do that. And one of the ways that you do it is that um, as a patent prosecutor, former patent prosecutor, when you are going for an application, if you get it approved, in a short amount of time, that means you did a horrible job. You did a horrible job because that means that your claim is extremely narrow. That means that what you're claiming out there in the world, that property line is very, very small, which means it's unlike that it's unlikely one that anybody's ever going to infringe on it, but also it's not that useful because that means people can what's called design around it. They could figure out how to do your thing, basically do your shtick, without infringing actually on the patent because it's so narrow because it's so narrow so this is a really good idea but like we can do the same thing 10 different ways exactly exactly and so as a patent prosecutor your job is to get the what's called the broadest level of protection you want to extend that property line as far as you possibly can and a lot of times even though you will do what's called prior art searches which is like you'll then search hey what is similar to this idea so that I can kind of figure out how I can kind of gauge things. Where that things. puzzle piece is going to fit in. Exactly, right? exactly. Okay. Let, let, me, let me go to the county, figure out where the property lines are, just figure out where I can build my house type of a thing. Okay, so this is like idea gerrymandering. Basically. Pa- okay. ba- basically. That's, a, that's actually a really okay. good analogy. I like that. Uh, it's very true. And so what you'll do is uh, you'll, you'll then kind of then figure out what, where that property line could be, and you try to go as, as broad and, and expand as you can. And then what you do is... Um, the reason why it may take up to five years is that there's a lot of back and forth between you and the patent office. You file that application, you're not going to get your first notice from the patent office until about a year, maybe 18 months later. You just file it. It's out there in the ether. You wait, and then something comes in the mail where it says, we've looked over your application. We can't grant it at this time because we found these prior patents or prior uh, um, items that were already sold out there in the world that do what you're talking about. I wonder what about. that search database looks like. Is that something that's public or is that... It's public. It's, okay. it's public that you can search for, but it, it, it's it's very much an art on how to search for it. So what you'll do is you do, the patent examiners, they're not just a bunch of patent examiners that just broadly search that database. They're assigned different sections of what to search in that database because it's very much like going to a library, but not knowing the Dewey Decimal System, not having a librarian to help you do that. Everything's out of order, nothing's alphabetical, but you have an idea of kind of what theme the books are, are in. They're like, well, this is like a sci-fi theme. Over here, it's like, you know, more of like self-help theme and stuff. And then you're trying to go through it and find it on your own. It's it, There's a lot of stuff that's been patented out there. So it, it, takes, a, um, it takes somebody who's very experienced in searching um, which they've actually divvied up among the patent office as to being in their respective art unit. That's what they call it, art unit. Got it. So on the patent side of things, when you hear someone bring an idea to you and say, hey, this, and then you do a patent search, is there any like professional liability if you miss it? And say, hey, we file for this patent, or would that get picked up by the patent office saying, hey, this is too close to that? And if that misses it somehow... Is that like, all right, they're good. They got their patent and it was approved. And even if something comes up later that, no, someone had an application for something that had a very similar use case with, like, they were broad enough to, like, infringe on it, or would that just come out in litigation? Well, uh, yes and no. And, 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 and let me, I'll start with the first part of your question first. So generally what you do is the reason why you do the prior art search First and foremost, you want to make sure that this actually is a new idea because there's a, I can't tell you how many times I had inventors approach me saying, I have the, this is a million dollar idea. And it's like, this was patented in Korea like five it's years ago. It's a sham ago. wow, dude. Yeah, it's yeah. basically that yeah. and, and stuff. And then, so a lot of times what you're doing is you're just trying to educate them and go, look, it's going to be very hard getting this. 
are you sure you really want to spend 10k just on getting the pat on try on doing the application process mm -hmm. and then another 10k doing the litigation process of trying to get it uh, get it through and uh, approved by the patent office and it's really just so like you educate them so that they know look I only have a 20% chance of getting a patent or sometimes hey you you have really high chances it's like 90% we can get this patented with you know some degree of reasonable protection for you and that's kind of what you do um, Always, almost always, the patent office will come back with a denial. If it actually comes back with an acceptance, that means you really messed up. Sure. It means you, it's either means you found a one in billion dollar idea that no one's ever thought about, uh, and you happen to get lucky, or two, that examiner, um, uh, that examiner uh, 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 thought, wow, this is just so narrow, it's not going to fringe on anything that else that's out there. Yeah. So I'm going to give it to this guy. So amazing. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So that that level of detail does not typically, I mean, Lior alluded to it. It's like, it is getting down, like, I mean, it, how does that juxtapose against like work comp? Cause that's going to be your bread and butter, right? That's what yeah. you guys are doing. Yeah. That's what you did prior, like after you decided to do patent, you went into work comp defense. Yes. So how juxtapose patent to this, like, how do you use that? Well, it's really kind of like how your brain is wired in a way, because you're so used to looking at things in detail. A lot of times, like you get like a medical report that comes in, you're looking at every little thing. Um, specifically, what I look for is like, what did the applicant tell the doctor? A lot of people may overlook some certain things where they go, he said he's able to lift, uh, you know, 20 pounds and he ha or, or something to that effect. And then you realize, no, wait, he never had to lift anything at his job. Like what, you know, that that's not his job description. That's not what the witnesses said. That's not what his manager said. So that little detail can mean the difference between, you know, yeah, this is substantial medical evidence, this medical report, or no, this guy was actually lying to the doctor. Credibility. Credibility goes right to that. So it's little things like that. Um, paying attention in depositions, you know, um, Lior, uh, you know, the way he described how we do our depositions, it's a little bit different from what a lot of people do. You know, a lot of people want to come across as just, a, you know, they think they watch too many episodes of Law and Order and they think just by, you know, yelling at the person or being really um, forceful towards them or an aggressive, uh, that's going to give them the information. It doesn't. Because at the end of the day, all I'm going to make them squeal. That <laughs> kind of thing. Kind of thing. Because okay. at the end of the day, all they have to do is say, I don't remember. Yeah. That's it. I don't remember. Yeah. And so, but when you're nice about things, but you're paying attention to the details, that's when you can kind of do that. So what I usually do is, is that if I hear something um, that's like, oh, wait, that's, that's interesting. Let's go down that, that rabbit hole. I'll save it for maybe 30 minutes later. So you're like, it's active listening. You have you to, are, you have to. It's, are you taking notes during this time? Yeah. I, I am. And okay. usually well, I'll, I'll, I'll type it up really quickly um, as I'm just, you know, because I'm constantly typing because as they're answering my questions, I'm typing up the answer, but I'm kind of like making mental notes of it. And if you're doing it right, I mean, you're kind of mentally exhausted at the end of it because a lot of the depositions last like two, two and a half hours straight, maybe with sure. a 10 minute break. And so that time you're actively listening, you're actively watching their body language, you're actively watching the attorney's body language to see if maybe you're touching on something that they're not comfortable with and you're trying to navigate that whole thing. So it's, you, you the details that's, are very important. <laughs> that's really cool. So your background's like hyper beneficial for what you're doing now. Yeah, but I feel yeah, like very a ton of so. other attorneys that would be in your role might be doing like the, here are the questions I need to ask, here's yeah. like, I need to have this tone. Very much so, yeah. Okay, so yeah. very like templated, and yours is like I'm actively letting out line. I think that's what Lior said is like let out a bunch of rope. And yes, that's how you do it. That's how you do okay. it. Okay, and you let them uh, let them kind of paint themselves into a corner. What percentage of attorneys do like operate that way? Uh, aggressively. Well, the way that you guys do. I'd say probably less than maybe like ten or fifteen percent. So it's not wholly unique, but it's also not super common either. Yeah, there's a gradient, I'm sure. There is a gradient, but a lot of times, even people that do come across initially as open and nice and warm, it will come out at some point in the deposition. The applicant will answer a way that they feel like they're not getting the information that they're entitled to. And then the person will start being hammering it and being a little bit more, more aggressive with it. I never let that aggressive side come out because it's not beneficial for anybody. Um, if they start not giving me the answer I want, I'm like, oh, okay, that sounds great. And then uh, I'll go down a little bit. I'm like, but are you, are, are you sure? And then kind of do that. And a lot of times 
you know, when you basically act like Oprah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. it opens up, you know, they, they, people feel like, hey, this person's actually listening to me. It's not as bad as the attorney told me it was going to be. So they relax a little bit. Yeah. And the they, expectation, the attorney's, hey, this guy's going to come at you. Like, don't feel like exactly. say anything. Exactly. Is that attorney representing like the applicant's attorney jump in often? Uh, it really depends. If you're being very aggressive, they will jump in often. Uh, again, it, it runs a whole gamut. It depends upon you know whose office this is and stuff. Um, with my depositions, it happens very infrequently. Um, and it's usually over something rather minor that we then go off record and they're like, hey, you know, it's... I don't mind if they answer it, but can you ask it, you know, maybe this way just to be on the safe side? I was like, yeah, no problem. I'm still getting the same information that's going to lead to, you know, subpoenas or, you know, witnesses and stuff. So, you know, no sweat with that. But um, I've, I've seen deposition transcripts where the person is just a real hard ass and they get absolutely nothing out of it. It's just a whole bunch of objections from applicant's attorney. They get absolutely nothing and you're not really doing your client a justice. And, and everybody's and, uncomfortable and you feel like you did a good job because you like were emotionally charged. Right. And then you end up giving your client a, a bad product because now you're going to have to either um, do a meet and confer and re-ask a lot of the questions in a nicer way. Or, you know, uh, uh, try to, you know, find other some way around it to get those questions answered um, of what your client's paying for it. Sure. So you're just making things more expensive for your client. So I have a question for you. This has been brought up by uh, another attorney. Um, and he does not love the way that we ask our clients to do modified duty at nonprofits. Not not for profits, I don't think, but <laughs> nonprofits. Um, and the reason he was so worried about it is due to the civil liability that happens when you have your employee working at another location, like a Goodwill or something like that. Is that something you can speak to? Do you see those often? I don't. I don't see those that often, honestly. Um, but I would imagine that, you know, if you have, because it, it all comes down to who's vouching for this person. If something happens, who's going to be taking on the liability of that? So as long as things are pretty well clear, laid out, and documented, you usually don't. Um, you, I don't imagine you would run into too many problems and stuff. One of the things that we do that I have seen is like what happens with like PEOs. The only time I, that you really run into issues is either when things are not documented, somebody doesn't have the proper insurance, and then all that kind of stuff just kind of falls. Very popular for PEOs not to have the proper insurance. Right. And then everyone's just doing a bunch of finger pointing. That is, that yeah. blew my mind. I think Lior told me that like uh, a few episodes ago and he's like, a ton of PEOs just don't have proper insurance. Yeah. And so yeah. for a lot of these folks are like, I need labor now or like staffing solutions. Yes. So staffing more than PEOs actually. Oh yeah. That happens. A lot that. of staffing companies will be in PEOs. Yeah. Um, that happens often. It really does. I that's mean, uncomfortable. That's like an uncomfortable thought because staffing companies are getting larger. Oh yeah. Like that's not like that industry is slowing down and it's very easy to start one up, operate in the dark gray, let's say. Mm. And then if something goes sideways, like, all right, we shuttered this one and now we've reopened another one. Right. So what kind of like, is there any prosecution for that kind of stuff happening ever? So what, unfortunately with the, on the work comp side, when you're trying to deal with a situation like that where somebody gets injured and the person doesn't have proper work comp insurance, um, a lot of times what you'll do is either if it's a cumulative trauma and you happen to have some of the coverage, the way the courts will do it is that they'll put it on the the entire shebang on the person with the, with the coverage. And sure. Because so, they're like, well, either they're, they're the insurance, they can shoulder all this. If it's something like that to, that's like a specific injury, that's when things are handled a little bit differently. Um, what they'll generally do is you'll then get, um, uh, uh, you'll basically file some special forms that basically says, hey, look, this employer that should have had insurance that said maybe they had insurance is a deadbeat and they actually didn't have it. So then what you do is you get the state involved and then the state, uh, the state then will get, will get involved, kind of shoulder a lot of the litigation and what have you with that. Um, but it develops a lot of civil liability because essentially you're throwing that, um, employer under the bus. You're basically saying they did something wrong. They should have had insurance and they didn't and they have to pay for it. So there's, it absolutely does open up civil liability for that employer. So it absolutely makes sense. And it's a lot cheaper when you think in the aggregate, just to have the proper insurance in the first place. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that is adjacent to my previous question was um, when you have a work comp case, there's a lot of like, I feel like most work comp defense attorneys are like, they are the ambulance chasers. Like we have a new client. He's like, no, there's literally attorneys at the medical clinic. <laughs> 
like trying to grow my business. So there's a lot of actual ambulance chasers, but there are some really quality work comp defense, uh, or not work comp defense, but applicant attorneys applicant out attorneys, there. Yeah. And um, what they'll often do is generate a work comp claim as a Trojan horse to get a civil claim going. Because mm. that's where they understand all like the attorney fee money is. Yeah. How often do you see that happen? And are there any things like, cause it's something that I, I hope you and Lior like start doing is when you go settle like a work comp case and get a compromise and release or something like that, um, that your like a voluntary resignation is also saying, Hey, here's your settlement yes. and we're closing out not only the work comp case, but any potential civil liability as well. Yes. Uh, that is really important to have in the compromise and releases. Uh, I thankfully, have not seen that too often. It does happen, but that's because a lot of the employers that I do work with, they document everything. Sure. They, they cross their T's and dot their I's. They make sure that everything is, is on board. And so one, if it does, a lot of times they just don't even file the civil claim because there really isn't that civil liability mm -hmm. there. The employer really didn't do anything wrong. And the, the evidence is, you know, way more in favor that no this person is probably either lying or the conditions were weren't bad to you know initiate a, a violation of state law or anything like that uh, has happened but again that's, we see it happen yeah not often but once or twice a year yeah it's one of the things like if we're not working with you with you two or albert mckenzie like we're we're deeply unsure that like even the the carrier from one of the big houses is because they don't care about the civil liability. Their entire like focus is all on the work comp. Right. Right. And so the issue with that is like their job is to like zealously advocate on behalf of the policyholder. And if yeah. they're not doing that part, which is like, Hey, that like, obviously your part is the work comp, but like that is a major throw in to get them to oh, sign. It is. it is. So was there a reason why attorneys don't do that? Uh, why applicants attorneys don't throw in that civil civil claim and stuff? Uh, no, why uh, defense attorneys won't get that signed off that they're like waiving their ability to file civilly? Uh, a lot of times, I, I would imagine that it's just it's difficult for the applicants attorneys to advocate for their client to do. They will maybe want to keep that open. Um, there are a lot of applicants attorneys that also do the civil side as well, but some of them only do work comp and everything. So maybe that's not a severe a sphere that they're very familiar with and stuff. I've had a few applicants attorneys that, you know, have even told me like my client wants to do a civil claim. I don't know how to do it. <laughs> like, that's pretty funny. Yeah. Yeah, I'm like, do you know anybody? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, well, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But if I could throw in an extra five K and they yeah, sign off on it, maybe, yeah. maybe we're good with that No, But so, um, is that something that'll happen? Either you throw in some extra money and they'll sign off on that? Yeah, all the time. Okay. That is something that I think is really, really critical. And the reason why is there's a lot of companies out there that don't have EPLI. Yeah. They don't have it. And if they do, like carriers are moving out of California for EPLI, like nonstop. There's not a ton of carriers that still right. want to write that. And if they do write it, they typically have large deductibles. So like yeah. 50,000, 100,000, 250,000. And then, and then maybe like even a sub limit for wage an hour. Yeah. So those kind of things, it's like there's, it's, that's an uninsurable risk. Like, yeah, you have insurance, but you're not, you don't have insurance on your deductible. Yeah. And so I feel like a, a proper way to conduct yourself from a work comp defense standpoint is like, Hey, we're looking after the client, the policyholder first. Right. And if it costs us a little extra to settle this thing to like not expose them to like a $50,000 deductible or hundred thousand dollar deductible, anything like that, that's definitely the play. Oh yeah. That, that's a smart way to do it. I mean, I've had a, I've had a few claims. Like I said, I've had a few claims where there's a civil aspect to it. Um, in one case it was this person had alleged that they had a, you know, CT cumulative trauma injury, but then also said that the, her boss was sexually harassing her. And this company does everything on the up and up. They're very good with it. Everything, everything within the warehouse is under constant surveillance. Um, there's always multiple witnesses and, you know, nobody's ever left alone with anybody. So you always have like this mountain of evidence to say this never happened, you know, and then you take the deposition. I'm Mr. Nice guy. I then ask this person and then it turns out, no, he just used some slang that could have a sexual, you know, tone to it. But in context of doing what you're doing, it 
it's 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 actually meaningless. They're just trying to you know reach for possible low hanging fruit to sure. expand on the claim. So then once you kind of kind of realize that and you realize there's really nothing to it, then that's when you have the the conversation with the attorney, with the applicant's attorney. You go, look, I understand that they have this other aspect of it. There's there's not a whole lot that's gonna you know be you know to base it off of. You know we have a mountain of evidence on our side, but the employer is willing to throw in some extra money if they're, if they're willing to sign off and you know. Does that, that come from the employer then? I would assume that portion of it. So twenty thousand for CT and the employer would come from the carrier. Does the carrier pay for that? So it, in my in this specific circumstance, this 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 employer had a very very high deductible. So they were basically the ones that was basically dictating what happened on sure. on, on on that. So um, they also had an incredible team where they had the civil side and work comp side working together. So almost any time like you would have that possible duality, civil and workers comp, the two attorneys would be in constant communication of what's going on. And, and it would be nice if that was happening. It doesn't happen often. It's, it's a great system. It yeah. works out very well because a lot of times, you know, say, say for example, there actually is, you know, a lot, you know, potential civil liability for something and they're just not willing to settle it. You know, you have to kind of reach that agreement and go, look, we're going to settle out the work comp side. This is the amount that it's going to take. We think this makes sense, but then kind of, we're going to, pass it off to you and you're just going to have to do your side or maybe even the civil side settles before you. And then, you know, you kind of go, go from there. That makes sense. Uh, the last question I have for you, I've asked Leora this before. Um, we think what we do is like wholly unique in the marketplace and we do a lot of communication. Um, this is when Leora is with Albert McKenzie. Um, we do a lot of communication with the work comp defense council. How often are you interacting with brokers? Like on your side of things, if at all, I'm interacting pretty often. Okay, and it's very That's good to and hear. it's very helpful. It's very very helpful. So a lot of the um, coming from my prior job and then starting our own firm, I've kind of kept a lot of these relationships going because some of those accounts have you know switched over to me, and so uh, we have a very tight relationship where it's basically the adjuster, broker, and employer. And we're, and that's more of like strategy, like what's the best way to kind of go about this. We have you know. We often have, you know, roundtables where we kind of figure things out. Again, this employer has a very high deductible, so it makes sense. But absolutely, it's it's communication is key, and then getting everyone kind of on the same page, but in the loop is is the best way to do it. Because, go ahead. Often, what I've seen at other firms is that you know they keep the broker and the employer in the dark, and they're only communicating with the adjuster. And a lot of times, they're not keeping them in the loop, and that's not the most optimum way of doing things. You know, the most optimum way of doing things, at least what we believe is keeping everyone in the loop and keeping everyone in within the communication. So everyone's kind of on the same page of the best way to kind of go about and take care of the claim. That makes sense. Were you dealing predominantly with high deductible? Primarily? Yes. Primarily okay. Yes. That probably is what's going on. That makes more sense. Cause I, I guess when I talked to Lior about this, cause I, he typically worked on guaranteed cost stuff. Yeah. Is the broker was very rarely involved, but I guess if there's a deductible out there, like the broker's job is to function as a risk manager, and as such, they need to step in to say, "Hey, yes. this is all insurable. This is the employer's money. Like, let's create a strategy to get this closed effectively." So, we, you, what, in my experience, what I saw that primarily with, because these were the clients that I was dealing with, was when you were dealing with the um, farm workers. So high probability of getting injured because you're working with industrial equipment. You're always outside. High likelihood of tripping. Very high deductible. Um, the broker does a actually act as like a risk manager and, and is very active involved. Is it the actual broker or is it a staff member from the brokerage? Actual broker. Interesting. Are they like competent when it comes to like how the system works? Very. Very. Or do they own their agencies? Yes. Shit. Okay, because I was going to have you recruit for us. <laughs> uh, well, that's that's good to hear, especially in the ag space. We're trying to break into the ag space right now. It's like a completely different animal than like any other industry. It's very strange. I didn't think that farming would be it, but it's like it's seeing like there's different carriers in play yeah. there. It's a very unique space. Um, well, Sean, I'm stoked for you. I think like the Thank first you. time I met you is a, a few months ago, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we had sushi and... Um, <laughs> I like to go off on your own and like take the chance and have the courage to do what you and Leora are doing. Like most people have the ability to do that, but typically out of some maybe practicality, like the illusion of practicality, like mm -hmm. it makes sense. Like I'm going to stay at my good job. I'm going to hit partner. I'm going to do like do all yeah. those things. 
um, to have the courage that you guys did is, is really admirable. It's awesome, man. Congrats. I appreciate it. But when you have a great partner like Lior, it, it's, it's, it's a lot easier. It's, it makes that. it a lot easier. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Sean, thanks for the time. Pleasure. Dude. Thank really you so much. It. Thank you. We'll get you on again. All right. Later, awesome. Doug. Thank you.